In police museums all over Europe, there are items of evidence that have brought some of the world's worst criminals to justice. Behind every object in these crime museums is a fascinating and sometimes macabre story. Though guns have been popular as murder weapons for hundreds of years, the scientific method for examining firearms as evidence, commonly called ballistics, is a relatively new science, only fully accepted in 1930. A basic theory of ballistics is that every gun barrel contains minute irregularities, which are peculiar to it alone. In our first case, detectives were faced with an horrific shotgun murder. Eventually, after 15,000 house inquiries and more than 5,000 interviews, it was the ammunition itself that provided the vital evidence. On the 10th of November 1976, Angela Willescroft, a 20-year-old senior cashier, was at work at Barclays Bank in Ham, near Richmond in Surrey. At 12.30, the bank was fairly quiet, but due to fill up with workers on their lunch break, Few people noticed a dark-skinned man carrying a yellow raincoat walk up to Angela Willescroft at till number three. He was heard to say, give me some money. And what happened next will stay with those who knew her forever. I was sitting doing my banking exams, and I got a phone call that came through that said that Angela had been shot. Couldn't believe it. A um, friend of mine, devastating news, never heard of anything like that before. Angela had done as the gunman asked. But at that moment, the safety glass shattered as the force of the shotgun blasted towards her, mortally wounding her in the neck and chest. Before long, Chief Superintendent Jim Sewell from the murder squad at Scotland Yard was at the scene. Inside the bank, there was a mass of people, and so really the scene of the crime, it, it, well, to, to my point of view, it was mayhem. As a result of this, it was very difficult to ascertain from the street side, that is, who were the witnesses and who were the suspects? Two men outside the bank, a milkman and a greengrocer, had seen a man hurriedly leaving and described him as wearing sunglasses and looking as if his face had been artificially blackened. With this information and the recollection of the bank employees, a description of the murderer was issued. Amidst the confusion, Chief Superintendent Sewell was able to extract several useful items. Shot was removed from the rear wall behind the bank counter. Glass and shot from the other side of the counter was painstakingly collected and taken away for examination. Even the glass screen itself was taken away for analysis. When we were in the bank, we found this raincoat, and the first thing we did was to naturally search it. And in the raincoat, we found some the documents relating to a wine club and a shopping list and a man called Graham. That the man to whom the coat belonged was driving in the area and he heard my broadcast on local radio. And he told me the shock was so much that he nearly came off the road. We were then able very quickly to find out that the raincoat had come from a car that had been parked in the Bentles car park in Kingston. The yellow raincoat had been in his sister's car on the day of the shooting. The car, an Austin A40, had been parked at about 10.30 on the morning of the murder. His sister, on returning to the car at about two o'clock after shopping, discovered that the car was parked in a slightly different position to how she'd left it. She also saw that a yellow raincoat, a pair of sunglasses, and an umbrella were missing. At the time, she thought the matter was too unimportant to report it to the police. But there were no clear sightings of the driver of the vehicle, and though they had a better idea of his movements, they were no nearer to discovering his identity. But firearms experts were having some success. Tests showed that Angela Willescroft had been shot with a 12-bore shotgun. The shot itself was also identified. Then came the breakthrough. In an unrelated incident, Hampshire police discovered guns and ammunition in a car stolen by one Michael Hart, a well-known local criminal. 
The police knew that this could be an important lead in the Angela Woolliscroft case. Checks revealed that the gun had been stolen from a gun dealer, along with a Webley revolver, and most importantly, an 80-year-old Riley shotgun. Within hours, police had a warrant to search Michael Hart's home. Hart was nowhere to be seen, but his wife was at home. Hidden under the stairs, an officer found 19 Ely shotgun cartridges. But Chief Inspector Sewell immediately saw that there was a problem. The ballistic forensic team had categorically stated that the shot that had killed Angela Willis-Croft was Ely game shot, not the harder trap shot often used for clay pigeon shooting. It was really very frustrating. And it was then that I took the bold step of opening the cartridge. And when I opened it and it spilt out on my desk, to my untrained eye, the content of the cartridge looked identical to the ones in the bank at Ham. Again, purely on a whim, I instructed the uh, detective inspector to go to Birmingham, to Ely Kinnick, and sort out this particular problem. They were horrified to find that in some strange way, some of the cartridges had been filled incorrectly. And although it was clearly marked number seven, trap shooting was in fact a uh, game shot. We then could prove that the cartridges found in Hart's possession were unique. The identification of the pellets, now without doubt, pointed the finger at Michael Hart. Hart was a hardened criminal who was under suspicion for nearly 50 robberies and who was wanted by French detectives for the attempted murder of a policeman and the knifing of a taxi driver. But Hart had gone to ground. The arrest of Hart came about uh, in a strange way, really. Hart went into a garage in Hounslow He'd gone there very cheekily to collect some money that he was owed. And the manager there was an ex-detective constable, strange to say. And he was aware that Hart was wanted to be seen by the murder squad and uh, got in touch with the local police. And he was arrested and brought to Richmond Police Station. He was a man with a previous, many previous convictions, including violence. And yet, during the interview, he never came across as being a violent man at all. He was, he was almost... Uh, placid, reserved, answered the questions. He didn't necessarily tell the truth, but one wouldn't expect that. After several days in custody, during which time his wife was allowed to visit him, Hart asked to see Jim Sewell. On this particular evening, I was sitting in my office, feeling pretty miserable, because everyone had worked so hard, and I thought, mm, we're not going to get anywhere. And the detective sergeant came up and said, Oh, Governor, he wants to see you. And so I went down to the cells at Richmond Police Station, and in front of his wife and his brother-in-law, he said, I did it. I killed the girl in the bank. It was an accident. And, of course, uh, that was hallelujah as far as we were concerned. Eventually, Hart described how, after the shooting, he'd returned the getaway car to the Bentles car park, and on his way home, had thrown a shotgun into the River Thames. He pointed out the exact spot, and police divers were able to retrieve it. At the exact moment I arrived, the gun had been pulled out of the river, and so we had really our prize. And one barrel had been fired, and the other was cocked. And we were able to then pull out the cartridge, of course, that hadn't been fired. That was identical to the ones in the box we'd found in his house. The contents were identical to the shot that had been fired, and the gun was embedded with glass from the screen. And so we were able to corroborate uh, the whole of the, the actual offence. But Hart's claim was that the gun had gone off accidentally, and this possibility now had to be thoroughly investigated. The shotgun had been renovated before it had been stolen, and the renovators, when traced, specified that the trigger pressure should have been between four and five pounds. In fact, it was discovered that the trigger pressure for the right barrel from which the fatal shot had been fired was approximately six pounds. This made it very unlikely that it would have gone off accidentally. 
numerous pressure tests were carried out to try to get the gun to go off without pulling the trigger, but with no success. The only way to make it go off was to slam the butt on the ground so hard, pieces chipped off it. On November the 4th, 1977, Michael Hart was found guilty of the murder of Angela Willescroft. In passing sentence, the judge stated, you're a very dangerous criminal. It's essential that the public should be protected from you for a very long time. The police were praised for their dedication in pursuing the investigation. In the hunt for Angela Willescroft's killer, no stone was left unturned. Barclays Bank offered an unprecedented reward of £50,000 for the identity of the killer, and subsequently, half of that money went to police charities. Perhaps the most important development in forensic ballistics was the invention of the comparison microscope, a piece of equipment that enabled the marks on a crime bullet to be compared microscopically with a test bullet fired from the suspected murder weapon. With the use of this microscope, our next case helped to establish the credibility of firearm evidence. The case had a huge impact at the time and is still the subject of controversy. 27th of September 1927, the body of a local policeman, 36-year-old PC George Guttridge, was discovered in an Essex country lane. When police and a police surgeon arrived at the scene, they were horrified at the extent of the man's injuries. PC George Guttridge had been shot four times in the head. Two of the shots had gone right through his eyes. From the corpse, a trail of blood led to a pool of blood six feet from his body. And it could be seen that a vehicle had hit a grassy bank by the roadside. Guttridge's pencil was grasped in his right hand and his police whistle was lying outside of his tunic. His notebook was lying near his body. Unfortunately, it was blank. Why would a policeman in an area unused to serious crime be so brutally murdered? The Essex police immediately called in Scotland Yard, who assigned Chief Inspector James Berrett to the case. Berrett had had 38 years of police service, but this would prove to be his most famous case. For Berrett, the most likely scenario for the events of that dreadful night were that Guttridge, walking home after a late night patrol, had stopped a car. Your car, sir. and was about to take notes when the murder took place. His murderer, or murderers, had driven off into the night, leaving hardly any clues behind. Barrett quickly interviewed people living nearby, one of whom remembered hearing what sounded like revolver shots, followed by the noise of a car driving past around three or four in the morning. Finding this vehicle became key, and when news came in that the local doctor's car containing some of his medical equipment had been stolen, it seemed probable that this was the murder vehicle. But the aspect of the murder that provoked most outrage was the way in which Guttridge had been callously shot through the eyes. The post-mortem results had shown that the first two shots through Guttridge's cheek had been fired from a distance of about 10 inches, but the shots through the eyes had been fired at an even closer range, point blank. This suggested the work of a hardened criminal. It also had supernatural connotations. The eyes used to be the favored secondary target of gunmen employed by mafioso to take out people. But there's another myth associated with shooting a man's eyes. Well known at the time of PC Guttridge's murder, it was a pseudoscientific theory that the eyes retained the last image that they saw before death and could provide valuable clues in cases of murder. A search of the area revealed two spent bullets embedded in the road. Only a day after the murder, the doctor's car was found abandoned in London. The front mudguard was splashed with what looked like dried blood. Although the medical instruments were missing, the police found an empty cartridge case the head of the CID examined the cartridge case. It bore the mark RL4, which meant that it had been manufactured at the Royal Laboratory in Woolwich. 
Though three of the four bullets recovered were very distorted, one of the bullets extracted from Guttridge's brain was recognisable. CID called in eminent firearms expert Robert Churchill. He identified this bullet as being fired from a Webley revolver of .455 calibre. The link between the bullets found at the scene of the crime and the cartridge case found in the doctor's car had now been made. Then Churchill made a crucial discovery. He examined the cartridge with a comparison microscope, a relatively new piece of equipment that had never been used on a murder case in Britain before. The microscope revealed that on the bottom of the cartridge case, there was what looked like a small blister, a raised spot in the brass of the casing. On one side of the raised spot was a minute ridge, a single mark that would be found on every cartridge fired from that same weapon. PC Guttridge's murder had attracted huge publicity and there was a wave of goodwill towards the police who had lost their officer in the line of duty. The newspapers for many, many months following the murder covered in detail the, the investigation being carried out by the Metropolitan Police. The News of the World, in fact, offered a reward initially of £1,000 and then increased it to £2,000 for information leading to the arrest of the killers. Back at Scotland Yard, Berwick compiled a list of known criminals. Near the top was the name Frederick Guy Brown. Brown was well known to the police and had served many sentences for theft, forgery, fraud and larceny and was well known to have been in possession of a number of firearms. But the man was elusive and it wasn't until an informer tipped off the police about the location of Brown's garage in South London that they had him in their sights. Almost four months after the murder of PC Guttridge, the police confronted Brown. He was held on a charge of car theft and his premises and the car he arrived in was searched. Eventually, police found two revolvers hidden in the car, as well as a stock of ammunition which included Mark I, Mark II and, most interestingly, Mark IV Webley bullets. A number of medical instruments were found in the car. Brown was taken into custody. The police informer also implicated another man, William Henry Kennedy, and all police efforts were turned to tracking him down. Kennedy had met Brown while the two were prisoners at Dartmoor. Like Brown, Kennedy had spent the major part of his adult life in prison and was known to the criminal underworld as Two Gun Pat. Detectives traced him to Liverpool, and on the 25th of January, he was arrested. It was an extraordinary encounter, with Kennedy pulling the gun on the arresting officer, who only escaped with his life because the safety catch jammed. Now, Chief Inspector Barrett had his two prime suspects in custody, but with no eyewitnesses to the fatal shooting of PC Guttridge, the identification of the murder weapon was of key importance. Firearms expert Robert Churchill was immediately handed two revolvers that had been found in Brown's car and with extreme thoroughness, subjecting them both to a series of tests. When he examined one of the revolvers, Churchill saw straight away the imperfection on the face of the breech would almost certainly have caused a distinctive mark on the cartridge found in the doctor's car. With officers from the Woolwich Arsenal, Churchill fired over 1,300 different Webley revolvers to see if the telltale marks on the cartridge case could be reproduced in any way. None matched. Brown had denied any involvement in murder, but Kennedy made a statement that, in effect, painted Brown as the main culprit. He told Barrett that, whilst being questioned by PC Guttridge, Brown had shocked him by pulling a gun and shooting the policeman. And as he lay dying, cold-bloodedly shot him again at close range through the eyes. As they made their getaway, Brown told Kennedy to reload the revolver, and in his agitation, Kennedy fumbled and dropped the vital evidence, the cartridge case. Though Kennedy may have believed that he was portraying Brown as the sole villain of the piece, his statement, in fact, put him unquestionably at the scene of the crime. 
By admitting that he reloaded the revolver, he became an accomplice. Brown totally denied this chain of events, but Kennedy's words became the accepted version of the crime. The evidence that Churchill produced at the trial at the Old Bailey was that the cartridge case recovered from the vehicle could only have been fired from the gun recovered from Brown. He showed that the markings left on the cap of the cartridge case could only be made by the firing pin of that particular revolver. In his words, the markings were unique, almost like a fingerprint. Churchill and his comparison microscope had made forensic ballistic history. Though Brown maintained that he was completely innocent, both he and Kennedy were found guilty, and both were sentenced to death. On the 31st of May, 1928, Brown and Kennedy were executed simultaneously, one at Wandsworth Prison and the other at Pentonville. Few mourn their passing, but decades later, there are still some who believe that one of the duo was innocent, at least of this crime. Brown was a hardened criminal, but it is my belief that he was innocent of the murder of Police Constable Gutteridge. The prosecution evidence amounted to nothing that was not circumstantial. No witnesses had appeared to state that he had been seen in the Morris Cowley on the night of the murder. Brown had an alibi to show that he was at his lodgings on the night of the murder and had been served tea by his landlady. This information was never brought to the court's attention. And Brown was a strange man. He lived by a criminal's code of honour and would not point the finger at Kennedy. But my research shows that it is more likely that Kennedy committed the murder alone, using Brown's revolver to which he had free access. He then pinned the crime on the man he called a friend. A memorial reminds us of PC George Guttridge and the significance of the case in terms of the science of ballistics, which by the time of the Michael Hart case had become an accepted tool in crime detection. <laughs>